Good afternoon once again, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, we are about to begin and we ask for your continued cooperation. And this session is cutted to be uh, an interactive session. So we ask that when you need to, and only when you need to, please put your audio and or your cameras on. But in the times that you don't need to, please keep it off so that we can maintain the integrity of this production. It is now at this time with great pleasure that I introduce our president, Ms. Anne-Marie Ming Han. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a special warm welcome to our colleagues from the Mona and Cable campuses, as well as our specially invited guests. I acknowledge our advisory board member, Dr. Alfredo Walker, Dr. Dina L. Demalawi, pediatric pathologist of the Children's Hospital Eastern Ontario and staff of student, staff and students, sorry, of the University of Ottawa and Eastern Ontario Regional Laboratory Association. Thank you for joining us for the sixth installment of our Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Students Initiative. But before we begin, I would just like to invite Dr. Alfredo Walker to say a few words. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Welcome to this sixth installment. Uh, it seems just like yesterday we started this initiative uh, last year, August. Congratulations to uh, Ms. Anne-Marie Minhong and the executive of the Pathology Club of UWE. Um, we are very happy that this initiative is going from strength to strength. And um, we are quite pleased this afternoon to have a presentation from my very good uh, friend and colleague, um, Dr. Karen Bishop, who will be formally introduced by the moderator to this, for this evening's event. Um, as as Anne-Marie said, I just want to acknowledge as well, uh, Dr. Dinel Demalawi, my colleague here in Ottawa, who is at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, who, um, it was remiss of me, I only uh, just remembered to send her the invitation about 10 minutes before we started, and she has logged on. So welcome, Dina. And unknown to you, you will be one of the presenters in the future. So I now hand it back to um, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. And it is now with great pleasure that I introduce the chair of this afternoon's session, our Vice President, Ms. Amanda Francis. Thank you, Anne-Marie and good afternoon, everyone. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I am thank I'm tasked yet privileged to be introducing our featured speaker this afternoon, Dr. Karen Bishop. She'll be sharing her wealth of experience and passion in an overview of pediatric and perinatal pathology. I'll now give a brief background about Dr. Bishop. Dr. Karen Bishop is of Canadian nationality and resides in Kingston, Jamaica. Dr. Bishop completed her Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery degree at the University of the West Indies Mona campus in 1994, after which she went on to pursue her doctorate in medicine and pathology. 
Dr. Bishop then completed her fellowship in pediatric pathology at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto in 2005, and also serves as a consultant pathologist at the Department of Pathology in the University Hospital of the West Indies, Mona, and has served in these roles since January 2002. Dr. Bishop's areas of practice include general pathology and pediatric pathology, including perinatal pathology, but her main area of interest is pediatric pathology, including perinatal pathology, which she's extremely passionate about. Without a doubt, Dr. Bishop stands humbly and proud as a pioneer in the field of pediatric and perinatal pathology. We are all honored, pleased, and privileged for you to be here with us this afternoon. And as such, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to welcome Dr. Karen Bishop. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to uh, speak to you on pediatric and perinatal pathology. Thank you for your very kind um, introduction. Okay, so I think a couple things. Um, business first. So I'm going to ask you, please, um, students not to screenshot any of the photographs in this presentation. There, um, there are some, and please remember, they are from patients. They are from the infants and children of, of parents. So um, I'm asking you to respect their privacy and please not screenshot any of the photographs. And therefore, by extension, not share them. Um, on another note, um, just to say in the Caribbean, it's a bit difficult to practice pediatric and perinatal pathology exclusively thus far. Okay, so our administrative systems, you know, hospitals, governments, etc., they um, to date have, although that is changing gradually, perhaps pathology is a bit behind, you know, you know, the clinical folks, they don't necessarily consider us. Um, first when they're making advancements and changes. So um, up to now in most places, um, you have to practice your subspecialty except for forensics along with general pathology. And so that's what we do here. I do a lot of general pathology, um, a fair amount of perinatal, fair amount meaning just based on what we um, see here, not in terms of uh, general volume and some pediatric pathology when I have the, the surgical pathology when I have the opportunity to. So when we say pediatric pathology, um, who are we talking about? If we look at it as a general specialty, then it starts all the way from pre-viable fetuses um, and placentas. Um, and in that, that group, those fetuses fall under the group we call perinatal. So perinatal pathology is pathology of um, pre-viable fetuses and placentas, stillborn infants. So in other words, viable infants who were lost before they were born. And when that starts can vary from institution and uh, country and region. At the moment, WHO is using greater than or equal to 22 weeks of pregnancy. But I can give you an example. For instance, here um, we use 24 weeks of pregnancy because based on the facilities we have, um, we are not really able to get infants to survive under 24 weeks. And so that is our um, cutoff for pre-viable fetus versus stillbirth. Um, I should say, though, that cutoff is really for statistics, okay? So we will come back to talk about the importance of statistics in perinatal pathology. Um, it also includes live-born infants up to seven days of life in its uh, strictest sense. Um, it also, so pediatric pathology goes on to include pathology of infants, um, neonates, meaning those up to a month of life, and then infants up to a year of life, and then children and adolescents. And again, the upper age limit can vary between institutions and between you know, regions and countries. 
WHO used to do zero to age 14, but now they do um, zero to age 19. So um, the, it includes the full um, adolescent period um, and now. So what are the divisions of pediatric pathology? We kind of just mentioned it, but just to show you in a flow chart as a, a way of summarizing. So pediatric pathology, um, there is the autopsy service and the surgical pathology service in, broad, in a broad sense. Uh, you could talk about pediatric autopsy service versus perinatal pathology service. And this perinatal pathology service um, when you are dealing with viable infants, then we talk about autopsy. And in some places like here, when you're dealing with pre-viable infants, and, and remember I said that the age group or the time of pregnancy for that can vary depending on where you are. Um, so for us, pre-viable infants are examined um, as part of our surgical pathology service. And um, just to remind you, within the field of pediatric pathology, you, could, you have all the subspecialties. So you can practice general pediatric pathology. Um, you can have cardiac pediatric pathologists or gastrointestinal pediatric pathologists and so on. So why do we need a subspecialty of pediatric pathology? You know, there's some general misconceptions that are floating around even within the medical fraternity. So for instance, children are just little people. What's the big deal? Pediatric pathology, people think that if you say pediatric pathology, you're talking about autopsies on babies and that's the full range of it, which of course it's not. And there are lots of people who think, you know, what's the point of doing autopsies on babies? You know, most of the time you don't find anything. So um, why, why are we bothering? Okay, so some of the, the reasons why it's important, for instance, the disease profile in children is different from that in adults. Um, the normal histology is different or can be different. So for instance, if we look at the fetuses, the pathology of organs, it changes practically by the week or by every few weeks as the organs develop. So you need to have some experience with recognizing normal at the various stages. Or if we look beyond that, if we take something like, um, like the testes as a random example, the pre-adolescent um, testis is different from the um, adolescent and adult testis. So um, um, things like that. The other thing about it is the actual practice. So the way we examine things can vary. The examination procedures and diagnostic considerations, of course, can vary um, sometimes from that of um, general slash adult um, pathology practice. All right, so let's look at the, mis the first misconception. Children are just little people. And um, I'm going to ask for your interaction as well now, students. Okay, so let's take first question. What are the most common cancers in men in general. So I don't know if Anne-Marie is going to assist me with um, people who want to participate. Good afternoon. So you can either unmute your mic or you can type in a chat. Don't be afraid. It is meant to be a nice and fun interactive session. Would anybody like to try? What are the most common cancers in men? So we have mostly saying prostate. Yes. Yes, Jonathan is saying okay. prostate as well. All right, good afternoon, non cancer. Yeah, somebody just said that. Lung, so prostate cancer, lung cancer, any others? Moses also saying colon as well. We have Trevon saying colon as well. Right, so 
prostate, lung, can, um, lung and colon, those are among the most common cancers in men. What about women? Afternoon, breast and cervical. Breast, cervix, and one more to round off the top three. Oh, so you're saying endometrial? Um, so no, endometrial is not in the top three, but that's fairly common, yes. Amanda yeah, is saying colon as well for women. Yeah, so colon. Okay, so this next slide shows you um, some Jamaican figures from the Jamaica Cancer Registry. Um, and this registry, of course, monitors mainly um, cancer incidents in Jamaica by using the Kingston and St. Andrew population, which is more than the percentage required to, uh, that, to allow you figures that reflect uh, figures for your country. So in men, between 2008 and 2011, the Common ones were prostate, lung, colorectal. Um, this is a miscellaneous group of um, many cancers and because it was multiple cancers put together, it came there. So if we overlook this one, then stomach, for instance, skin. Women, breast, cervix, colon, and then uterus, okay? Further down, lymphoma. So in the top 10 and leukemia, but not in the top five. Right, so what about children? What are the most common cancers in children? So let's, let's say in children under 15. We have mostly saying lymphoma. So lymphoma would be one. Anyone else would like to give it a try? Good afternoon, leukemia. Leukemia and lymphoma, yes, yeah? so those are two of the most common ones. Any others before we look at those statistics? Mosi is also saying osteosarcoma and brain cancer. Um, so brain, so osteosarcoma, um, if you are comparing children to adults, then adolescent children um, os uh, in particular have more osteosarcoma, but when you're looking at um, all cancers and their relative frequency in children, it's not one of the top five, for instance. Okay, so here from the registry again, um, these are from some published, from a published study. The study period was 83 to 2002 and the age group was zero to 15. So if you look here, leukemia, lymphoma, CNS, so brain tumors, Wilms, neuroblastoma. Okay, so those were the top five um, for both boys and girls together. And then if we separated boys and girls, similar with a few exceptions. So Wilms tumor was, um, for instance, much more common in girls than it was in boys, okay? But um, a similar group of tumors if we look at the top six. So if you look at this, you realize none of these tumors are similar to the top six in adults, okay? So it, I'm just showing you to, to show you how the profile of disease can um, differ in children as compared to adults. So if you're interested, there was also a study from um, Trinidad on um, pediatric cancer incidents. It was published in uh, West Indian Medical Journal. So you can have a look at that. This, the figures are similar. Uh, one interesting thing, for instance, was that, uh, if I remember correctly, both the Trinidad study and Jamaica study showed this um, higher incidence of Wilms, particularly in girls, compared to the inter to international figures. Um, Wilms is more common in black people, so that may be a contributing factor. And then even when you're looking at the group, um, children as a group, what you see will vary with age again. So if we take these two common um, tumors in children, Wilms and neuroblastoma, um, this is the age specific incidence rate. In children, we, we report this uh, per million 
because cancers are less common in children. In adults, it's per 100,000. So when we look at age groups now, so this is under one, one to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, you can see that these tumors show significant variation um, from between each of these uh, age groups. And in general, they decrease significantly after age 10. If we were looking at soft tissue tumor, like a uh, 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 bone, for instance, like osteosarcoma, you would see that the adolescent group has a significantly higher incidence than the children under um, uh, 10, for instance, okay? So in pediatric surgical pathology practice, what do we do? It's pretty similar to general surgery, a general pathology practice in terms of the modalities. So there's histopathology, uh, cytology, and then all the ancillary testing, immunohistochemistry, molecular pathology, et cetera. Um, we diagnose tumors, both benign and malignant. Um, your reporting includes given diagnoses and very importantly, as with pathology and surgical pathology in general, given prognostic factors as indicated. So an example would be a tumor like neuroblastoma. You don't just have to make the diagnosis. You have to go on to do some other things that help with prognosis. And depending on where you practice, you will have less or more. So some things um, take on particular significance when you have less. So one thing we would do with the routine slides in a neuroblastoma is to do what's called a mitotic karyoheptic count, where we count mitotic figures and karyoheptic um, nuclear debris. And this count, we put it together with the type, the amount of differentiation of the tumor that we see on histology, uh, the age of the patient, and those things help us to put it in a category that gives some idea as to how well the patient would do. And um, that was the traditional practice. But then for quite some years now, you go on to do molecular pathology. So in this tumor, you, you would go on to do um, MCN, okay, MCN gene amplification studies. You see um, whether the tumor is amplified or not. And that has bearing on both prognosis and on treatment, okay? Of course, just like in adult pathology practice, tumors are staged, and that also has bearing on um, prognosis. And then similarly, um, lots of non-neoplastic disease conditions, which uh, we would re report on. So sometimes it's just it's lumps and bumps, um, appendices, uh, in pediatric GI, things like uh, monitoring, using biopsies to monitor children with inflammatory bowel disease, that would be a fairly uh, common scenario. Um, in pediatric cardiac um, disease, you would do things like in places where they do transplantation, biopsies for um, monitoring transplant patients and uh, looking for rejection, things like that. Um, Simple things like sometimes biopsies of gonads in cases of ambiguous genitalia, uh, things like that. Okay, so those, those are some of the things that are a bit, uh, some are different and some are similar to adult practice. All right, so let's look at a surgical pathology um, case. So this was a four year old boy and he had a two-month history of abdominal swelling. And on radiologic investigations, there was a huge intra-abdominal mass, which um, involved the organ illustrated here. So anyone wants to tell us the organ that's illustrated in the photo? It's on my left. So I think, um, are you seeing the mouse? I have, I have the mouse on. It's a kidney. Right, so this is the cut surface of a kidney. Um, cortex, medulla, here is some of the tumor. 
But to be honest, the bulk of the tumor we're not seeing. Here is a cut section of the bulk of the tumor. It was a very large tumor. Um, it involved a kidney and it started to cross the midline a bit, sorry. Right, so based on the location of this tumor and the age of the patient, what's the most likely diagnosis here, for instance? Is it Wilms? Right, so Wilms is a good, uh, very good guess. Most renal tumors, definitely in the Caribbean, are a Wilms tumor. There are some other tumors, of course, much less common, um, like um, there's a meso mesonephric nephroma and um, some other sarcomas and so on that you can get, but Wilms tumor is by far the most common uh, lesion. So in this case, for instance, we would firstly make the diagnosis based on the histology and then we have one or two prognostic things we would have to do. So in this case, we would look for features of anaplasia that has a specific definition. You're looking for nuclei that look a specific way with bizarre mitoses and so on. And we would report on that. Okay, so diagnosis plus um, whatever prognostic features. And this is a resection. So we would also um, do a pathologic staging for the lesion. All right, so this is a poor little newborn baby. And he had this very large mass, which was recognized prior to birth. So he was delivered by cesarean section. So anyone wants to make a guess as to what this is likely to be? So if I point out that this is, this would be in the, so this is the lower back, right? So this is in the sacral region. Is, is this a sacral coccygeal um, teratoma? Right. So this was an example of a teratoma. It's in the sacral coccygeal region. So this is a sacral coccygeal um, teratoma. So teratoma, that's a big group of tumors that we see in children. Um, and they can range from mature teratomas to immature to those that have um, malignant germ cell tumors in them. All right, so those are just a few examples of um, some of what we would do and see in pediatric um, surgical pathology practice. And um, the rest of the presentation, we would we're gonna have a look at what we do in autopsy practice. So pediatric autopsies, we have um, different groups or different types that we can do. So of course they're perinatal autopsies. Remember we said those include pre-viable fetuses, stillborn infants, live-born infants up to the first, who die within the first seven days of life. And along with the fetuses and infants, we want to examine the placenta ideally. If we move beyond the perinatal period, we can look at it in terms of having hospital or slash non-forensic autopsies versus forensic autopsies. And just like in general forensic um, practice, you have natural and unnatural death in children. Um, some of the things that cause natural sudden death would include things like infection, like uh, for instance, uh, pneumonia or viral infections, sepsis with lethal organisms, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, um, not very common in the Caribbean at all, but it does um, occur. Uh, cardiac disease, um, sudden death in epilepsy, um, metabolic diseases. Okay, these are just some of the um, more common examples. And on natural death, which of course can be accidental or non-accidental. Um, I know 
that you would have, if, and I'm assuming you already had your forensic talk, so or if you haven't, you would have it soon, so I don't need to go into this, but just to say in children, um, especially in infants, some of the things that cause accidental death are quite different. So you have things like, um, for instance, children getting, apart from regular motor vehicle accidents, um, falls from a height, okay? Other things would include things like uh, children who get caught between bits of furniture. So between the bed and the wall, between the dresser and the wall, they crawl into dressers and then they get trapped in there. Um, in babies with sudden unexpected death, you have, we have something called overlaying where babies in bed with mom, um, mom who either because she's deeply asleep or because she um, is altered by a drug of some kind can actually roll over onto the infant and um, cause death by, uh, and cause death. So we have, so I can give you one very sad example here. Um, when I was an intern here on our labor ward, we had a woman who delivered normal baby and our postnatal ward was overcrowded. Um, for those of you who are senior students, and I don't know what's, what it's like in Trinidad, I suspect it can be similar. Um, it can, you can have some issues with uh, crowding and bed availability on, um, for instance, the postnatal ward. So this was one such day. And so mom delivered. Um, she got put onto the gurney, but then they stopped them from taking her down, asking that they please wait for space. And then we were full on, on the labor ward as well. So they didn't have a bed to put her on and she stayed on a gurney with the baby and she breastfed the baby and then she fell asleep. And so the nurse went to take her down to the ward and she was dead asleep. And she had very large breasts and the baby was under her breasts and not breathing, okay? So that's a very sad example of accidental um, death. And of course, there's non-accidental death. And in the pediatric population, child abuse is a significant um, and important component of this. Okay, so that's all the different types of um, autopsies or the types of autopsy service, services that we can offer. Okay, so what's the point of doing all these baby autopsies? That's, that's another misconception. I'm sure you've heard it. If not, you're going to hear it eventually. Why are we doing it? Uh, you, what's there to find? And this is not from, um, it's not out of the blue. So in the era when we did not routinely examine placenta, it was not uncommon to do autopsies. This, this is in reference in particular to perinatal autopsies. So it was not common to do a perinatal autopsy and have no findings that either explain death or perhaps um, have uh, features that could contribute to death. Um, however, um, in the current era, we found that uh, we know now that placentas, uh, the placental disease and things that affect placenta have significant bearing on babies. And so doing combined examination um, has changed that, um, has changed the outcome when we do these autopsies. So why are we doing them? The first thing to know is that for perinatal autopsies, the perinatal statistics um, on perinatal death, they are a reflection of obstetric care. Okay, so if I skip right down to one group that we're doing these autopsies for, or one reason, we're doing them to classify perinatal death, um, which is very important for statistics. So you can take it at different levels. It can be for a ward in a hospital, um, for a hospital in general, because they're responsible for the obstetrics ward, regions in bigger countries, national, um, in all countries, including our island nations. And these statistics are used to monitor obstetrics care and to correct deficiencies. So an example would be in the 80s in Jamaica, they did a big national study 
And Prof. Jean Keelan, who is one of the, um, I'm not, I hope it's not offensive to say she's a grandmother of pediatric um, pathology. She came and supervised this national study. It was a, it was a pretty huge study. Jamaica's population is, above, is um, over 3 million. And um, sorry, almost 3 million. And so they um, tried to do autopsies on as many babies as possible. And from that study, they recognized that um, intrapartum asphyxia was a problem in some places, especially in the more peripheral places, where, because there were a lot of peripheral hospitals um, and there was a lot of home delivery going on and so on. And so they were able to put in measures to significantly reduce the incidence of intrapartum asphyxia based on those stats. Okay, so these stats are very important. There are all sorts of classif different classification schemes that are used to classify perinatal death. Um, different groups may choose different ones, um, but, but it's a really critical um, service. So on a much more personal level, we do these autopsies to try and give parents some understanding of why their infant die, died, keeping in mind we don't always have an answer. And of course, to let the pediatricians and obstet obstetricians and, they, and the other team members know why a particular infant died. So these are just two studies that uh, illustrate the why these autopsies are important um, or how. So this was an, a study from 1998. Uh, 174 babies, but what they did was look to see how the autopsy answered questions, if any. So they found that in 29% it was diagnostic, in 43% it confirmed the clinical diagnoses, in 13% additional information was gained, and I can, I can tell you today, we had an autopsy this morning, an infant from our special care nursery, um, born prem at uh, 28 weeks, but was quickly ventilator dependent and they couldn't get the baby off the ventilator. And um, baby uh, throughout his life had lots of episodes of apnea with cyanosis. So the baby died and this morning we did an autopsy. And what did we find? A small tracheal esophageal fistula okay, which was unrecognized clinically and may have some contribution to the baby's periods of apnea and cyanosis. Okay, so that's an example of additional information. And um, in 2002, there was a review of multiple studies. And so overall, they found that autopsy changed or added to the diagnosis um, in as much as 70% of cases, depending on uh, which study you looked at. Okay, so it's a critical service. What do we actually do in these autopsies? There is, of course, the gross examination of the infant or fetus. We take um, the, the microscopic samples. We widely sample from most organs for um, general um, HNE examination. Microbiological cultures as indicated, but often indicated in perinatal and pediatric autopsy practice. Radiology in cases of child abuse, um, accidental uh, trauma, for instance, um, genetic studies as relevant, and in perinatal practice, we examine the placenta. You ideally want to examine the placenta of all still births and fetuses and live births where relevant. So for instance, live birth with infection, you want to look at the placenta for chorioamnionitis as a possible um, inciting factor. Okay, this we mentioned already, just talking about how placenta really changed um, how we, how much more we can explain perinatal death and placental pathology continues to involve and evolve and provide more answers. All right, so let's look at some examples before we close and uh, we take comments and questions. So this is an example of 
um, a fetal autopsy examination. This, um, the, in this instance, I don't remember the mother's history and why, um, why the, the history was simply preterm rupture of membranes at 20 weeks. Um, I think she showed up with a rupture of membranes. They couldn't stop the delivery and she delivered this pre-viable um, fetus. Um, it looks this color because uh, the baby was in formalin and the examination was performed post um, fixation with formalin. So here is the little baby. These are not from position in the container. He uh, did have some abnormalities like fixed flexion of the wrist. That was a genuine abnormality and the ankles here. And so we open the chest and abdomen. So this is the diaphragm here. This is liver, bowel, this is the heart, should be here, right? So it's pushed over to the right side. This is the right thoracic cage. What is this, anyone? That's loops of bowel. Right, so that looks like loops of bowel and it's above the diaphragm. So what would be the diagnosis here? What do we call it when you have Abdominal contents in the thoracic cavity. The oh, baby had a diaphragmatic hernia. Right, so this is an example of a diaphragmatic hernia. This is the diaphragm, so the defect would be in the left diaphragm here, and that's a loud bowel and um, the, the number of abdominal organs and structures that you can find in, this, in the chest secondary to this herniation can vary, right, depending on the severity. But they occupy the chest, the um, chest, and typically the lung on that side is hypoplastic. This is a small lung, and the heart is pushed over. So if we skip to this photo, this is showing you the larynx, trachea, and the lungs. And this is the lung from the side with the hernia. It's significantly smaller, okay? To be honest, this lung is smaller than normal as well. Baby had some other abnormalities. So this is a horseshoe kidney, for instance. And in the heart, uh, we had bicuspid pulmonary valve, I think. And a, I believe there was also a BSD. So this is an example where um, the cause of fetal loss was unknown. And then we found um, major malformations on examination of the baby. Uh, some other things that cause fetal loss, one of the more common things, especially in the middle of the pregnancy, is infection. So chorioamnionitis in the mom, um, which we see on examination of the placenta. You could have things like infection of the parenchyma, the villi of the placenta, called villitis, and um, I'll show you some other conditions in a while. So this is a bigger infant. And we are looking at a photo of the open heart. This is the aortic valve here. And this is the interventricular septum, looking at it from the left side. So anyone can tell us what, what abnormality this photo shows? Can you see my pointer? Or do I need to turn on a pointer? Nick is saying VSD, ventral septal defect. Right, so um, this is the aorta, the aortic valve, the interventricular septum from the left side in the left outflow tract. And here we have this large hole. Can understand why the colloquial term is hole in the heart. Okay, and this is a ventricular, a uh, large ventricular septal um, defect. This was another uh, baby with a congenital malformation. This is a bladder, one ureter and the other ureter. It's not the best photo, but this is the bowel. This is the transverse colon. The ureter has no business being the same size as the colon, right? So if you do that comparison, that allows you to recognize 
sorry, that's not the colon. I'm sorry, that's stomach to duodenum. Okay, so even worse. So the ureter has no business being the same size as the gut, right? So this um, shows significant dilatation of the um, ureters. These are the kidneys. They haven't been dissected yet. So this is what they look like when we fixed and cut them. And the pelvic calicial system is pronounced. Can I see the pelvis? Um, and this is why it looks like we have these pronounced spaces here. Okay, so the baby had hydrocephalus and even had another unusual complication where fluid collects between the kidney and the renal capsule. So then uh, this was a boy. And so what is the cause of this obstruction? And so we went looking for that. Um, this is the bladder here opened. And here is the first part of the ure uh, urethra, the prostatic urethral portion. Here is the vera montanum. Okay, and we have this structure that's not normally there. Um, here it is again. Okay, so we thought this was consistent with posterior urethral valves um, causing the urinary tract obstruction in this child. And um, as you know, in adults, um, urinary tract obstruction is common, but completely different profile, right? So in many it would be things like prostate disease, for instance. Okay, so um, malformations are obvious, especially when they're uh, major malformations that can have either can either explain death or have contribution to the death of the infant. But um, sometimes when we do the examination, the uh, cause of death is not in the infant, as I said, it's in the placenta, or at least the placenta has significant contribution or explanation for us. So here is a placenta um, from a third trimester baby um, who died. And this placenta has a long cord that is highly coiled. We call that hypercoiling. It's excessively coiled. And one of the problems with that is you can get thrombosis in the fetal vessels, in the cord and at the fetal surface. And this thrombosis, when significant enough, causes areas of the placental parenchyma to be lost. Those villi are lost. And this can in turn affect the baby and cause death of the baby. Even when it doesn't cause death of the baby, you can have associated um, thrombosis in the baby with um, infarction in organs. So things like thrombosis in the renal vein with uh, infarction of the kidney or of the gut causing intrauterine ischemia of the gut and strictures of the gut and so on. So um, this is just to show you the same from the same baby. This is a control slide, blood in a vessel. But here is another vessel with calcium and all of this. That's a very old thrombus. And here are other vessels with more recent thrombosis. Okay, so just, just so that you can get an idea of what it looks like. Um, this is a placenta from a woman who had preeclampsia, okay, and preeclampsia affects the maternal vessels of the placenta, um, and um, this can be associated with infarction of the placenta, and the more parenchyma you lose to infarction, the higher the risk that you're going to lose the baby um, uh, when this happens. So. This vessel here shows fibrinoid necrosis, all that pink stuff instead of um, a thin wall, which is normal. And this one is filled with foamy macrophages. Um, these are just some of the features. Um, this is not the best photo, but um, an uninfarcted portion of placenta. Whereas on this side, we have an infarcted portion of placenta. So these are things we can see. Okay, and we actually know that above a certain percentage of loss of placental parenchyma by, um, to disease, for instance, infarction, then the risk of losing the baby goes up significantly. Okay? So babies who have these, um, 
who have issues that interfere with um, oxygenation and therefore have hypoxia. There are some features, they're not, you wouldn't call them diagnostic really, but you can see some features. Like in this case, I think it's best illustrated here. You can see petechiae, for instance, um, on the lungs and sometimes on thymus and um, on the pericardium, as well as an indication of hypoxia in the baby. Okay, so in terms of things that would cause us to lose babies in a perinatal period, we saw uh, malformations as one thing. We know infection is another thing. Prematurity in the current era, prematurity internationally is the most common cause of um, perinatal death. Okay, so these are lungs from an infant. And you know, we hear about respiratory distress syndrome in prematurity, or nowadays we talk about lung disease of prematurity. And so this baby has um, the acute manifestation of that. These pink things line in the airways. This is an airway here, okay, called hyaline membranes. So this shows hyaline membrane disease, which you see in the acute phase of lung disease of prematurity. Definitely we see that within the first um, week of life. So these babies are hypoxic and they can have complications of hypoxia. One complication is this, so pulmonary hemorrhage. Airways here are filled with blood. Another complication of hypoxia, um, germinal matrix with secondary intraventricular hemorrhage. So this is a very premature brain, uh, a brain from a very premature infant, I should say. Here are the lateral ventricles. You can see this one is filled with blood. On this side, you can actually see the hemorrhage in the parenchyma adjacent to the ventricle. Okay, and then you get the hemorrhage here first and then it gets into the ventricular um, system. Okay, so all of those are, um, are, I should say those are just a few of the things that we do and things that we can diagnose um, in pediatric pathology. So I've come back to this chart um, just to close by saying what you do is clearly part your choice um, and part the environment that you practice in. So in the um, in the most advanced environments you can be a gastrointestinal pediatric pathologist. But in the least advanced environment, which at the moment is uh, what most Caribbean islands, um, the, the way we practice, we, the way we practice is um, because we don't have enough pathologists for one person to be super specialized, right? So in a lot of the islands, you would probably be practicing general and pediatrics. Okay, and there's an in-between where in some places, some pediatric pathologists, they only do surgical pathology. Some are only perinatal pathologists. Okay, so quite, um, quite a broad range to get involved in in this field. Um, it's an exciting field and really it's what you like. So some will find perinatal pathology practice very exciting. Some pediatric pathologists want, they would prefer to practice this minimally or not at all. And they want to focus on surgical pathology practice, uh, which puts you in the realm of pediatric tumors and non-tumor pathology. Um, and like I said, some can be specialized. One, one subspecialty where we tend to have people very focused is um, neuro, neuro um, pathology. Okay, so pediatric neuropathologists, that's all they do, pediatric neuropathology typically. Okay, so um, I'm going to close with this um, famous photo of children, including some albino children. I don't know if you uh, have already been exposed to the fact that in some countries, albino children are killed or um, disabled because, um, because of uh, mythical practices of different kinds. People believe that 
limbs, for instance, or tissue from albino children uh, will bring them all sorts of wonderful things. Okay, so very, very unfortunate incident. And I don't remember the photographer, but that it was on that background that this photograph was taken. All right, so any questions or comments? At this point, if you'd like to ask a question or comment on Dr. Bishop's presentation, you can unmute your mic or type your question in the chat and we'll read it out. Okay. Someone said no questions, but it was a great session. Thank you. Um, one uh, question. Yes. One question is, what inspired you or led you to choose pathology, specifically pediatric pathology? So I started in pediatrics. I didn't start wanting to do pathology or pediatric pathology. So when in medical school, um, when I did pathology, I found that I had, I, found, I liked that pathology explained things because I was a really bad swatter and for me to remember something, if you explained it to me and I understood it, I would remember it much better. And I love that at the medical student level, pathology explained diseases. But I was destined from before medical school to do pediatrics. So um, in the, I had a period to wait to start the program. I had six months and I, it was known that pathology is a really good place to go to ground yourself before you start your subspecialty. So I came over to pathology for six months and really loved it. But I went ahead and did the first year of pediatrics and decided that I'm too sensitive and delicate for pediatrics because it, I found it, um, for me, it was very, very stressful to deal with sick children and their highly stressed parents. And sometimes we had our Caribbean issues to deal with in the midst of that, because you have parents who they won't do what you want them to do because of the, the way they think. Um, that's probably not Caribbean, that's probably international. The way they perceive it and the way they perceive you intruding on trying to run their child's life and so on. And um, so during that year, I decided that I would do pediatric pathology. There was no one practicing it. And um, since I liked both fields very much, I decided to combine it. And um, that, that's how I came to that point. So by the way, that, that uh, let me say right now, remember you're allowed to change your mind. You're allowed to change your mind before you start a specialty and you're allowed to change your mind after you start it if you realize it's not really what you thought or there is something else along the way that you found more exciting. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Um, another question is, why did you choose to do a fellowship in Toronto and what are the steps involved in completing a pathology fellowship in Toronto? Okay, so... Um, who, because I was a UE grad and I did not do my residency in the US, I did my res residency in the Caribbean. So at the time to get to do a fellowship in the US, you technically needed to have um, done your residency there. And I did still write one or two places and had some varying, I had one or two responses. And um, Canada was open at the time to take a new WI graduates. I believe they still are. And so I knew that sick kids, if you're looking at Canada and definitely on the East Coast, Eastern side, then sick kids was the place I wanted to go. I had some exposure, I guess, from, from the clinical side with ill children. And um, so I wrote them and asked if I could join. So that's, that is one way, but the formal way is through University of Toronto. Okay, so University of Toronto has a whole network 
of um, hospitals that they are that are affiliated to it and so you can apply for various um, subspecialties through University of Toronto. The issue currently is that for most foreign nationals trying to do a fellowship, there are two things. They must have space and you need to be funded. So getting funded um, in time subsequent to me, or even in my time, um, has become an issue. So for a lot of people who want to do fellowships, it's done through, you need to be affiliated to an, in our environment, you need to be affiliated to an academic institution like UWI, for instance. And um, then either, if you're not affiliated, then you would need maybe your government. So you can have institutional sponsorship or government sponsorship um, to sponsor you. In other words, they have to pay your salary for the period that you would be doing that fellowship. Okay, so there is a pediatric, Society for Pediatric Pathology, okay, that um, North American, meaning US and Canadian pathologists belong to. And um, I belong to it, so external pathologists can belong, either as affiliate or I um, eventually asked if I could become a full member and um, they did allow me to because it's really for North American pathologists. And on that website, Society for Pediatric Pathology, and there's a European one as well, Pediatric Pathology Society, they list positions that are available, including places that have fellowship positions. Okay, so the pediatric pathology world is fairly small. So while a lot of the listings would be from the US, a smaller amount from Canada, um, European places can also um, list either programs or job vacancies on those sites. So that's a place you could go to look to see um, which hospitals have space to accommodate uh, fellowships. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Now we have a very short and interactive feedback session. A mentee link will be sent in the chat for you all to click and simply give one or two words stating how you felt about Dr. Bishop's session on pediatric and perinatal pathology. We'd appreciate if you now click the link and follow the instructions. When you're done, there's also a feedback form for you to fill out. You can fill this out after the session is over. As a club, we want to hear your views so that we can keep improving our session. So on the screen, we have some of the reads shared about Dr. Bishop's session. Some persons said it was insightful, some persons said informative, interesting, thought-provoking, eye-opener, and delightful. Thank you. Okay, so as we draw to the end of this event, it is with great pleasure that I now present the vote of thanks for this evening's proceedings. Marcus Tullius Cicero quoted, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the, pre the parent of all others. And as such, I would firstly like to extend a hearty thank you to our inspirational guest speaker, Dr. Karen Bishop, who despite her busy schedule graced us this afternoon with an amazing and enlightening presentation. We are extremely grateful to have been granted the opportunity to learn about pediatric and perinatal pathology through your thorough and insightful presentation. We are honored that you agreed to do this segment to share your passion with us. Your words, advice, and knowledge will truly leave an indelible mark on our minds, and we hope that students and our virtual audience carry this knowledge with them into their future careers. We'd also like to express our appreciation for Dr. Alfredo Walker, who is also part of the advisory board, and we thank him for his presence tonight and his key role in supporting us throughout this journey. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Dina L. Demilowie, pediatric pathologist of the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, Dr. David Chaston, forensic and cardiac pathologist of the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service, and Dr. Nicole Davis, anesthetist in Birmingham, UK. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We truly appreciate your support. Additionally, I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our specially invited guests present here tonight, specifically staff and students of the University of Ottawa and 
Eastern Ontario Regional Laboratory Association. Last but not least, we would like to thank the audience here tonight. We'd like to thank you all for joining us and making our event a success. And we look forward to your continued support. During these uncertain times, we extend wishes of health and safety to you and your family. Also, we would like to let you all know that our next session would be on neuropathy, neuropathology, and it will take place on February 11th. Thank you all and good night.